Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our online forum um, focused on building a stronger Ohio, eliminating racial disparities, and improving economic vitality. I'm Amy Rowling McGee, the president of the Health Policy Institute of Ohio. The mission of HPIO is to advance evidence informed policies that improve health achieve equity, and lead to sustainable healthcare spending in our state. Thank you to the Columbus Foundation, to BI3, and to Interact for Health for their support of this particular project that we're going to focus today's conversation on, as well as all of our core funders who support HPIO's mission um, with their steadfast investment in our work. I also want to thank our 2023 Educational Event Series sponsors for their generous support of our forum series that make webinar webinars like today free of charge to participants. We look forward to engaging with you during today's forum. Um, we encourage you to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A box during the webinar. We'll monitor both and we'll answer questions as time permits. The slides and other information shared today will be on our HPIO website under the category events. Um, we'll drop a link to, to where you can find the slides in the chat here in a few moments. Research has shown that health is primarily driven or shaped by conditions where we live, where we work, and where we play. However, the resources, experiences, and environments that support health are not equally distributed and available to all Ohioans. By eliminating racial disparities, leaders in Ohio can grow our workforce, increase consumer spending, strengthen communities, and reduce fiscal pressures on both state and local governments and budgets. At today's forum, we're going to dive into that in more detail. Um, our speakers are going to discuss the factors that contribute to racial disparities in Ohio, they are going to provide data and insight about the economic benefits Ohioans could gain by eliminating disparities. And they're also going to provide examples of actions Ohioans can take and are taking um, to eliminate racism, improve health, and increase economic vitality. I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker, Glennon Sweeney. Glennon is a senior research associate at the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at The Ohio State University. Her work centers on the formation of metropolitan space, its evolution, and the role of suburban municipalities in creating metropolitan-wide equity. Glennon holds a bachelor's degree in geography and political science a master's degree in city and regional planning, and is currently a PhD candidate in city and regional planning at Ohio State. Glennon, thank you for joining us today to talk about the connections between race, faith, and inequity. Thank you so much. And I just want to also say how wonderful it is, um, the report that you guys have done. Um, I think it's really wonderful, and I'm really excited to be here today. So I'm going to see if I can make this work. Okay. There we go. I think it worked. Um, so I'm just going to give kind of an overview of the structural drivers of metropolitan inequality, kind of to frame the conversation and get us all on the same page. Um, so I'm going to start with a series of maps here. And so one thing we notice, we at the Kerwin Institute, we kind of made our name through uh, creating a methodology called opportunity mapping. So we do a lot of spatial analysis here. And when we start mapping issues, we start to notice patterns in Central Ohio. And so this is an infant mortality map. It's a hotspot map. So the red um, areas are where there are higher infant deaths, deaths. And if we notice, we kind of see this upside down T pattern of infant deaths in Central Ohio. 
And then if we, oh, I went too far. Um, look at the second map, it is opportunity. The lighter areas are lower opportunity. The darker red areas are higher opportunity. And again, we see that upside down T. And if we go to the next map, this is uh, this is poverty in, in Franklin County. Um, and the dark red areas are higher poverty rates and the kind of lighter, almost Band-Aid colored areas are, uh, are lower poverty. And again, we've got that that upside down T with, of course, the students in campus uh, being a little bit of an outlier there at Ohio State University. Um, when we map incarceration, we see similar patterns. Um, darker area, darker red is higher incarceration rates and we see similar upside down T. Same with uh, older adult vulnerability and density. Um, and so that's what this map is. The red and orange areas are the places in Franklin County where there are more older adults. Um, that are living uh, in, in more vulnerable conditions. Um, and so again, we see that upside down T-shape. And, and then finally we have, there we go, let me get to it. Our final map, there it is, is life expectancy. And so the dark blue is the highest life expectancy in Franklin County and the, the uh, kind of uh, bright green highlighter color is, is the lowest life expectancy. And again, we see that same pattern, upside down T, kind of runs along the southern, uh, just south of I-70 and east of uh, I-71. One thing I want to point out is the disparity in life expectancy. Now, I will point out that this was done before COVID. We have not yet calculated this post-COVID because we don't have the data for it yet. Um, but before COVID, we saw a 26.7 year difference in life expectancy between Dublin, our highest track, um, that where people are living 85 plus and, and here in Franklinton, our lowest track, which is is crazy if you think about it, because, you know, 26.7 years, if 85 is, is the high point, means that people in Franklinton on average are dying before they hit 65, before they are eligible for Social Security, for Medicaid, and, and really the benefits of being an older adult in our society, but they're most likely experiencing those life conditions. Um, in their 40s and 50s. And, and we think about that as the impact of cumulative disadvantage. Um, you know, and so what explains this? And today I'm going to talk about policies and practices that drive metropolitan inequality. And I am a city and regional planner, so a lot of my focus will be on the built environment. Um, and so I'm going to start with um, a practice. Um, and this practice was the practice of using restrictive covenants in, in housing. Um, deeds. And this practice really started when we started to build the planned suburban developments that define suburbs as we know them today. And so if we're thinking about central Ohio, um, Upper Arlington would be a very good example of that type of planned suburban community um, uh, built and funded very differently than suburbs were prior to that um, and really built for elite people and, and also for only white people uh, with the use of racially restrictive covenants. So restrictive covenants are very common in property deeds and they limit what you can and cannot do with the property. But around the turn of the 20th century, um, early suburban developers who were also realtors realized that, um, well, first they realized that, that inequality could be profitable. Um, and so this, you know, segregation could be profitable. And so realtors um, began to promote segregation. They began to promote a lie that the mixing of racial and social classes harms property values. Um, and they began using, when they were building these planned suburban developments, um, restrictions that would increase the cost of constructing, maintaining, or purchasing a property. Um, and so these included things like setbacks, limiting the amount of the property you can actually build on so that if you want to build a bigger building, you have to buy a bigger lot. Um, lot size, unit size requirements, also use clauses, single family only came from restrictive covenants in, initially, um, banning agriculture because it was uh, a practice, you know, having chickens in a, in a garden was a very common practice of people coming out of slavery from the South. Um, because agriculture was the main industry, but also Eastern Europeans who were not considered white at the time. Um, and they also included racial restrictions, which is the one that you see right here. Um, and they were prolific, almost 50% of all planned entire subdivisions, planned suburban neighborhoods in central Ohio were platted with these in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and they, they were, some were much more 
direct than the one I'm showing here that is very all encompassing. Anyone who is not part of the white or Caucasian race is not permitted to um, occupy um, any property um, except unless they are a domestic servant is, is what the restriction says. And so these were, were used quite prolifically and they then were adopted into zoning code. Um, and so that's where this exclusionary zoning comes from. A lot of those, those components of exclusionary zoning code, excessive setbacks, only single family housing, um, size requirements, those came from these, uh, these restrictive covenants, that idea. And so they were codified into law in that way. And that's where practice turns into policy. Um, you also started to see zoning used, though, um, because I will point out that white people weren't the only ones building these kinds of suburbs. There was a lot of African-American wealth, um, particularly in, in you know, the post-Civil War era coming up through you know, the 1920s or so. And these early suburban developments actually tended to be just outside of city limits or even inside of city limits. And a lot of the reason for that was because they wanted utilities and utilities were difficult um, to do on your own. And so you wanted to get them from the central city. Um, Baltimore, for example, um, had some African-American um, suburban neighborhoods that were very wealthy. And there was some wealth in some of these areas and, and there was segregation. But when they did their first citywide zoning code, they just zoned all of the black neighborhoods, including the wealthy black neighborhoods, industrial. And so that's called expulsive zoning. That's a practice that really it encourages detrimental land uses and directs them towards places that previously didn't have them. And it's really designed to be a disinvestment policy um, uh, for these communities. And so. And so that that continued and, and, and the field of planning actually really developed at this time. And a lot of the early planners, I mean, they were working particularly in the South to create, you know, racial zoning that wasn't explicitly racial by using these exclusionary and expulsive uh, zoning components. And so many of you probably heard of the practice of redlining. And so this is, you know, if we get into the 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 aftermath of, of the um, stock market crash in 1929 is kind of when we started to conceive of redlining. And that's because mortgages looked super different before the depression. Um, they were called balloon mortgages. You needed to have a 50% down payment. The mortgages had an extremely short life, like sometimes as short as five years, maximum 15 years, but typically less than 10. And so, you know, you've got the other 50% of the value of that home to pay off in that short amount of that time, but actually that's not what you're doing. You're only paying on the interest because we didn't pay on the principal back then in those early mortgages. That's why they're called balloon because then the other 50% is due after you make that final um, interest payment. And so that meant that the people owning homes tended to be wealthier. Wealthy people also bought stocks. So when the stock market crashed, a lot of them stopped paying on their homes and a lot of banks went under as a result. And so in the aftermath of this, the federal government has already made a decision. They want to build a middle class through home ownership because property is the number one way Americans build wealth. Property ownership is. Owning property is critical to building a middle class and even building an upper class, but building wealth in this country is through property ownership. So they wanted to open that up and build a middle class through that. But if they were going to do that, they needed to, they needed banks to give out loans to more people. So they needed to make a more accessible mortgage, which is they created the mortgage we know of today. Um, but they needed banks to feel comfortable making those loans. So they created federal mortgage insurance. But then the federal government started thinking, they're like, well, we don't want banks to give out loans that are too risky, though. And that's where these maps come in. These are risk maps. They're called residential security maps. And they grade neighborhoods based on both the built environment and the people living in them for risk. Um, so your A grade neighborhoods, these are your, your uh, wealthy white, they were restricted. They used racial, in central Ohio at least, all of these A grade neighborhoods used racial restrictions. A lot of the B grade neighborhoods in central Ohio, like Grandview Heights was built before we were using racial restrictions in central Ohio. And that's probably why they got the B grade. Um, but A grade neighborhoods are eligible for 80% of the value of their home and a federally insured mortgage. That's a 20% down payment. That's the origin of the mortgage we know today. Those B grade neighborhoods, still white, middle class, upper class, but just not as restricted necessarily. Um, and, and this was also subjective. They did this 
in every metropolitan area in the country in the 1930s with 40,000 or more people. All right. And so they were hiring local people to do this. That's so very subjective. What one person in Tacoma, Washington would grade B might not be the same as what someone in central Ohio or Cleveland or Toledo would grade B necessarily. Um, but B grade neighborhoods were eligible for 65% of the value of their home in a federally insured mortgage, and they had a 35% down payment. Your C grade neighborhoods tended to be working class, tended to be immigrant and ethnic hubs. hubs. Uh, they were often near industry. Um, and they might be experiencing what, at the time, the assessors who were filling out the forms and grading these neighborhoods would, would it describe as infiltration or neighborhood change, where they might be seeing a group considered non-white moving in. And that group could be an immigrant um, group because the, the definition of white uh, has changed dramatically over time. Um, and it's also very tied to religion. And so, you know, those... A grade neighborhoods tended to be Protestant because Catholics, um, Eastern Orthodox, people who were not Christian were not considered white at the time. And that includes like even Irish Catholics, Italian Catholics, um, Eastern European Orthodox. These people were not considered white. And so they might be, be seen as infiltrating a neighborhood. These neighborhoods were eligible for 15% of the value of their home in a federally insured mortgage. Friends, that is an 85% down payment. That's a very steep down payment. And so for those neighborhoods, this policy was a disinvestment in those neighborhoods. Well, investing and inviting investment into those A and B grade neighborhoods. Your D grade neighborhoods were where African-American and other uh, minoritized uh, populations, populations considered non-white, lived, um, regardless of class and also where detrimental uses were. Um, and these neighborhoods were ineligible for federal mortgage insurance. They were disenfranchised from home buying, from the traditional structures that facilitate home buying in the United States, which is huge because we build wealth in this country through home ownership. And this policy targeted people because of their race and disenfranchised them from doing that, from engaging in wealth building. Um, for example, the King Lincoln, our Bronzeville in Central Ohio, is this neighborhood right here. Um, in 1936, when the Homeowners Loan Corporation, that's the entity that made these maps, came around to do these assessments in the neighborhood, it was predominantly Black and Jewish. It was mixed race. It was mixed income. There were really wealthy African-Americans and Jewish families living in mansions owning businesses. There were also poor African-American and Jewish families working in the neighborhood, living in not as nice homes and maybe in a, even in alleys, but it was a mixed income community that shouldn't have all been graded red, but we were grading based on race. And so this is the outcome. And this determined who got mortgages because federal it's directly tied to federal mortgage insurance. And it's one of the origins of the wealth inequality that we see in this country to this day. So you might say, well, if you lived in one of these neighborhoods and you were one of these wealthy African-Americans, you would just leave, right? Well, here's where you couldn't go because remember, we were using racial restrictions and home deeds. So most of the places that are red and green on here where you're gonna be seeing property values increase and investment occur, these people were disenfranchised from accessing that wealth building and from, from engaging in and from taking part in that growth. And therefore, we're often stuck in neighborhoods that were typically more urban and, 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 and really just experienced disinvestment. And they were almost crumbling around them. And that kind of fueled what we then knew as the urban crisis later on. Um, and I do want to point out that, you know, the year after the Homeowners Loan Corporation was created. The Federal Housing Administration was created. And this was really realtors. Remember, realtors had been spreading that lie that the mixing of racial and social classes harms property values. And they'd been saying that for a while, and there had never been any evidence of it. But they could make a profit off of segregation. And so they spread that lie. They started using restrictive covenants in their home deeds. And they influenced the federal government 
to believe this as well. And so, you know, the, in the federal house, in the federal housing administration, was responsible for administering federal mortgage insurance. All right. And so, in their underwriting manual, they began to say, if a neighborhood is to retain stability as necessary, the property shall continue to be occupied by the same racial and social classes. Folks, this is what I call the big lie, because we still believe this, many of us in this country, that the mixing of racial and social classes harms property values. And I'm going to tell you something, it was a lie then, it is a lie today. And it is one that the federal government has propagated. Now, racial restrictions were challenged in court. And as it turns out, and they were a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment in a case known as Shelley v. Kramer. It was a really narrow case, though. Um, um, and so it wasn't until the passage of the Civil Rights Act or the Fair Housing Act of 1968 that you really saw um, protections for African-Americans uh, moving into uh, white neighborhoods. But I, I do want to point out that these early developer realtors who were building these planned suburban developments and, and, and created these re restrictive covenants that they put in these property deeds, they also built homeowners associations. And they did that in part because they pretty much knew that the use of these racial restrictions was probably a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And so they wanted a way to enforce segregation if those were considered illegal. And so what they did is they created these homeowners associations to do just that. And, and they did it in, in, in typically in two ways. One way they would do it, they would say, anyone can buy a home in this neighborhood, absolutely. However, you know, but all, all homeowners have to be members of the homeowners association. Oh, and we're gonna restrict membership of the homeowners association to whites only. So that was one way. Another way, and actually there's a, there was a homeowners association in Upper Arlington called the Northwest Arlington Association that got caught on this second way. Um, in the 1970s. And so this is called inserting for right of first refusal, which is not on its face a violation of the 1968 Fair Housing Act. It's the pattern of how you use it that 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 is that what is what got Arlington caught essentially. And so what this means is that if you have a right of first refusal, it means that the homeowners association has to approve all sales in the neighborhood. If they disapprove a sale, they have to purchase that house themselves. But think about that. They don't want homes sold to blacks and they just deny all those sales. They can purchase the home themselves and then they can sell it to a white family. And if you're a civil rights investigator, that's the pattern you're looking for. And that is the pattern that was found in Upper Arlington and that probably existed in many homeowners associations that were not caught in Ohio and throughout the country. Um, and so, you know, we we these policies really created um, disparities, right? We started to see investment in more suburban and peripheral communities. You can see it in central Ohio with all the red and the yellow being very much urban and central, right? And so that ended up being in large part where African-Americans would live or where people who were low income would live. But the disinvestment of being redlined or even being graded C, that yellow color by the homeowner's loan corporation made property values plummet. And so in the 1950s, when the federal government is trying to build, build the, the interstate highway system and they need to purchase land through eminent domain, the cheapest land to purchase is going to be in those neighborhoods that were formerly redlined or graded yellow. And as you can see from this map, that is overwhelmingly the case. We have highways, you know, very infrequently going through anything that is blue or 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 uh or green. And I do want to point out, this is 71 here, if you can see my pointer coming down along here. Now, 71 was actually supposed to go straight through the bottom of Bexley, that line that I just drew. But notice 71 takes a nice curve and goes around Bexley, and it actually goes through this little red neighborhood right here. Well, that's because Bexley lobbied to have the highway not go through part of its neighborhood, and it in fact went through instead a black suburb called Hanford Village. And Hanford Village had just a couple, like a decade and a half earlier, built um, housing for black GIs. Because if you recall, that GI bill was great, but all that new housing was being built in neighborhoods that were platted with racial restrictions. Because, oh, by the way, the Federal Housing Administration required racial restrictions in housing covenants. 
they required segregation if you wanted federal mortgage insurance for quite a while as well. And so, you know, the these these um, you know, so so these uh inner more inner city neighborhoods really um uh, suffered as a result and veterans were unable to build or buy homes in those 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 wealthier those places where homes were values were were rising and where investment was happening those more suburban places and so a lot of black suburbs ended up building housing for them eventually the fha opened up a line of credit specifically for black gis and hanford village did build uh, the washington carver edition as a result uh, but just you know a decade and a half later 70 was turned and destroyed much of hanford village um, that was then later annexed into columbus and you know, we, we actually don't really have many black suburbs in central Ohio in part because of annexation, but highways also played a role in destroying the fabric of those communities. And so this was this was accompanied highway construction was accompanied by urban renewal projects as well. And it also happened in tandem with a different way of thinking about public housing. And so prior to, you know, the, the, the mid 50s to 60s, when we built public housing in this country, it was relatively low density. It was typically like townhome style. The original Poindexter village in, um, in central Ohio is actually a very good example of that. It was townhomes with green space between yard space, lines so you could hang your laundry and, and just really good quality housing. We did a massive shift as we moved into the 50s and 60s and started building these high rise public housing. Um, and it was accompanied by this urban renewal. We were destroying these neighborhoods that were blighted for very good reason because they'd been disinvested in, right? And people weren't able to achieve home ownership in them either often. And so, you know, you don't have a lot of incentive to fix up your rental property, you know, but you might have a little bit more incentive to fix up a home you own. Right. And if you have low home ownership rates, neighborhoods might might deteriorate a little bit, a um, little bit quicker. And, and, and that was in part by design in some ways. Right. And so we bulldozed much of that and replaced it with these high rise structures, which resulted in the further concentrate. We further concentrated poverty in areas where poverty was already concentrated, where we weren't providing the social support structures that people needed. Right. And, and it just created what, what we now know of as the urban crisis. Right. But the impacts of urban renewal were, were widespread. It created massive displacement across the country. Um, and it would promise a one for one replacement of units and that never materialized. And I would further note that um, even suburbs used urban renewal um, because there were kind of peripheral black suburbs that had popped up that weren't necessarily wealthy. And when these planned suburban developments came in, they would often end up annexing some of that land. And when this urban renewal policy came, they were able to access some of those dollars to redevelop and essentially push out the African-Americans who had been living in those parts of their suburbs. Um, and I have some books at the end that you can, you can read about all of this in. Um, and so the results of this, and these are just, I'm just touching on a couple of these because we've got to move on with this uh, webinar, is really wealth inequality. People always talking about income inequality. We need to talk about income inequality. It's important. It's racialized. It's it, There's a gendered aspect to it. But wealth is where it really counts, friends. Wealth is how you do things like send your child to college without debt. Wealth is how you help your child buy their first home so that they can build wealth themselves and help their children, right? And wealth is where we see the racialized disparities most acute, acutely. And this is just a zoomed in map of central Ohio where you can see the difference in those, the, the size of the dots indicates the amount of, of wealth, you know, but compared to those older suburban, you know, suburbs like Bexley and Upper Arlington and Grandview compared to like the Near East Side. And I will point out down here's German Village. Can't we see that gentrification down there? Um, and so it really results in that. And so, you know, I have to say again, we've got this upside down T, this spatial inequality, right? Every map, an upside down T. Well, look at the shape of the red lighting map. Look at that shape. It's, a, it's an upside down T, friends. That's the origin of the inequality. And you can do this with pretty much any major metropolitan area. 
that this policy was done it. And you can illustrate these disparities rooted from a lot from these maps. Um, so I'm going to close. I do want to offer a couple of uh, uh, resources for folks. Um, some of the best national focus books that I've read on this topic that are uh, The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, um, Segregation by Design by uh, Jessica Traunstein, um, Freedom to Discriminate. That one is focused on the role of realty, and it is fascinating, friends, by Gene Slater. Um, Places of Their Own, which is a book about Black suburbanization, very fascinating, by Andrew Weiss, and How the Suburbs Were Segregated by Paige Glosser. And she actually does talk about King, King Thompson in her book, The Founder of Upper Arlington. Um, a couple of really great Ohio-focused books, um, Planning for the Private Interest uh, by Patricia, Patricia Burgess is focused on Columbus, Central Ohio. Surrogate Suburbs is a book about Cleveland suburbs by Todd Michney. Um, Getting Around Brown is a book about how the city of Columbus got around Brown v. Board and has very much to do with development. And Boomtown Columbus is also about Columbus, um, clearly in the name. It's by Kevin Cox, and it's really about what makes Columbus unique, but it also talks about how Columbus got around Brown and how inequality was formed in central Ohio. And it talks about it through a political geography lens. Very fascinating book. A couple of really great online resources. Um, there's a great video that I actually use when I teach called Segregated by Design. Um, it is actually uh, uh, narrated by Richard Rothstein. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, uh, redlining, there's a great website called Mapping Inequality that you can go to where you can explore They've digitized all of the red lighting maps across the country, and so you can go check those out. And then there's also um, a national coalition doing uh, restrictive covenants uh, work, and you can check out their work. Um, it's actually a coalition I'm, I'm planning on joining. Um, and so thank you so much. Uh, I will check the chat, I believe, for questions, because I'm probably <laughs> over time, I usually am. And thank you, folks. Thank you, Glennon. Thanks for that fabulous presentation. I, I've heard you present before, and I love the detail by which you break down the history of racially restricted covenants and redlining. Even though I've heard it before, it's always helpful to hear it again and in the level of detail that you provide. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, I think now we'll, we'll move on. And if you do have questions for Glennon, please feel free to put those in the chat. If you joined a little bit late, um, we wanna let you know that all the slides are available on our website under the events tab. And I believe Jasmine stuck um, the link to our events page in, into the chat. So you can just click on it there. There will also be a webinar uh, I'm sorry, a recording of today's webinar posted on that same site. I would be very much want you to stay online throughout the whole webinar, but if for some reason you need to leave early, you can pick up the rest of it there. And you can also disseminate the recording to um, friends, families, colleagues, anyone who you think might benefit from this information. So the examples shared by Glennon this morning are just a few examples of racist policies that um, have been implemented in the past, that were implemented in the past, that continue to have an impact today. Of course, there's others, other modern day policies and practices that have a similar impact. And now what we're going to do is go from talking about um, those more widespread structural policies to talking about the impact that these types of policies have on health and economic vitality. I'm joined this morning by my colleague, Carrie Almasy, who is going to um, talk about a recent HPIO publication, which is titled Unlocking Ohio's Economic Potential, the Impact of Eliminating Racial Disparities on Ohio Businesses, Government, and Communities. Uh, Carrie is the Director of Assessment and Planning at HPIO. She oversees needs assessments and strategic plans um, produced for decision makers at the state and local level and in both the public and private sectors. She leads projects on issues such as health equity, population health, healthcare spending, and the social drivers of health. 
She's the lead author of our featured publication, um, and she's going to share key findings from this research. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I am so excited to be able to share this with you and so glad that you were able to join for this webinar. As Amy mentioned, I'm here to talk about some new research from HPIO that's going to show why it's so vitally important to address the issues that Glennon just spoke about. When Ohioans are healthy and financially stable, our whole state benefits. But we know that these opportunities for health and economic prosperity are not currently available to all Ohioans. Before I dive into our key findings, I'm going to share a little bit of context on why the Health Policy Institute of Ohio published a report on Ohio's economic potential and why we're even wading into those waters. Um, so every two years, we release a report called the Health Value Dashboard. It includes more than 100 metrics that measure Ohio's performance on what we call health value, which is a composite measure of population health outcomes and healthcare spending. It includes metrics that explore our ranking as a state on everything um, from issues like heart disease mortality to issues like child and adult poverty. So on my screen, I've shared an example of a data point from the health value dashboard. It explores severe housing cost burden. And what that means is it's uh, the percent of households who spend more than 50% of their monthly income on housing. In Ohio, severe housing cost burden is 2.2 times higher for Black Ohioans than it is for White Ohioans. So what this means is when you're spending more than 50% of your income on rent, you have very few resources left to pay for everything that you need to be healthy, like healthcare and healthy foods, let alone other necessities in your life like childcare. Housing is an example of what we often refer to as a social driver of health. Um, it's important to note that inequities in these social drivers, such as access to affordable housing, don't just impact our health, they also impact our state and local economies. And that's why we're so excited to share one of our latest analyses with you. Our hope is that this will give you new data and information to take back into your communities and to build the case for implementing evidence-informed solutions that will achieve equity. So what did we measure? Uh, for this analysis, we worked with a nonprofit research firm called Altarum. First, we measured current racial, dispar racial disparities and inequities in income, health outcomes, and incarceration. Then we estimated the immediate economic impact of eliminating those disparities. So as if we were to wave a magic wand and make them all go away. And then finally, we looked out into the future to estimate how Ohio's changing demographics would impact this equation over time. To do that, we estimated what the uh, population in Ohio will look like in 2050 and what it would mean to eliminate disparities for that population. I'll go over those changing demographics in more detail later, but just so you know, um, it shows that what we found in the research shows that Ohio will continue to become a more racially diverse state over time. Next slide, please. So overall, we found that if we were to eliminate disparities by 2050, Ohio could gain almost $80 billion in economic output each year, along with the other benefits you see here on my screen, including things like increased income and employee productivity, reduced healthcare spending, increased state and local tax revenues. Um, but if you're like me and have a hard time wrapping your head around what $80 billion means, because it's just such a huge amount of money, I can put that in a little bit of context. So $80 billion is more than 40% of the state biennial budget that was just passed. Globally, $80 billion is more than the GDP of two thirds of the countries in the world. So it's a huge amount of money we're talking about potentially being um, able to bring into our state and benefit all of um, all of Iowans. Next slide. Before we go further into this analysis, I'm going to review the underlying drivers of the racial disparities that we measured. 
Next slide. Many of you who have uh, been to an HBIO forum before or seen us present are very familiar with this pie chart. It might just be our favorite graphic of all time. Uh, it shows that the majority of the factors that influence our health aren't related to clinical care, but instead come from our community conditions. Those uh, social drivers of health I mentioned earlier um, are represented on the left half of the pie chart, the social, economic, and physical environment. This includes things like the availability of employment and education opportunities. You can also see that underlying all of this are the drivers of inequities, such as racism, um, and these are creating barriers to good health for many Ohioans. Next slide. So racism unfairly and unequally distributes resources, power, and opportunity, and this results in disparities. It shows up in many ways in our society, and it influences people's ability to access the resources and environments that they need to be healthy and financially stable. As Glennon shared, one example of structural racism is current and historic housing discrimination, such as redlining. These policies have suppressed Black home ownership and limited opportunities to build generational wealth. Other examples include unequal access to employment and education opportunities, unequal access to healthy food and transportation, and overall these contributed um, over time to poor health outcomes and uh, reduced financial prosperity. But it's important to note that because racism has been built into systems like housing over time, these systems produce unequal outcomes without the participation of people who hold individual racist beliefs. So that's why we're so focused on these underlying policies. Uh, because of all those connections that I just shared, people with higher incomes tend to live longer and healthier lives than people with lower incomes. Next slide. But in Ohio, um, barriers to employment and wage growth um, are often experienced by Black, Hispanic, and Latino Ohioans, and this results in incomes that are less than two-thirds the incomes of white Ohioans on average. Thank you. If we were to eliminate this disparity in income, we would be able to grow our overall income as a state, increase economic output, increase consumer spending on goods and services, and increase state and local tax revenues. Next slide. This slide shows how the impacts of eliminating disparities in income would grow over time. We would gain this much money each year in Ohio by 2050. Next slide. Many of the factors that contribute to the disparities in income that we see also contribute to disparities in health outcomes, such as limited access to employment opportunities, transportation, and health insurance. Next slide. Ohioans of color are more likely to face these barriers to good health and to experience related disparities. You can see here that Black Ohioans are 1.3 times and Hispanic Ohioans are 1.2 times more likely to report fair or poor overall health than white Ohioans. Next slide. But if we were to eliminate these health disparities, we could reduce healthcare spending and grow our workforce by um, increasing and improving employee health and productivity. Next slide. This shows how these figures would grow by 2050. One slide back. All right, next slide, please. I also wanna drive home that there is a real human cost to the disparities we're discussing. Uh, for example, eliminating disparities in health outcomes could also greatly reduce premature death. So as I show here, white Americans have average life expectancies that are almost six years greater than those of black Americans. And we see a similar trend here in Ohio where black Ohioans are collectively losing thousands of years of life lost due to premature death before the age of 75. So when we're talking about years of life lost, what we're really talking about are babies who are unable to make it to their first birthdays, working age adults who pass away before they can enjoy, to before they can enjoy their retirement, enjoy those benefits, 
and older adults who lose years of life with their families. Next slide. But if we were to eliminate disparities in Ohio, we could prevent premature death that results in more than 135,000 years of life lost each year for Ohioans of color. And this is valued in economic terms at $14 billion each year. Next slide. So a lot of the same things we're talking about, poor economic conditions, unemployment, low educational attainment can also lead to criminal justice involvement. And Ohioans of color are more likely to experience these conditions and also be negatively impacted by unjust biases, policies, and structures in the criminal justice system. Next slide. So this results in stark disparities, including that Black Ohioans are incarcerated at six times the rate of white Ohioans. Next slide. But if we were to eliminate these disparities, 40% fewer Ohioans would be incarcerated and we could save millions of dollars each year in corruption spending. Next slide. Again, we could see the impacts of eliminating disparities in incarceration grow over time. Next slide. So the reason why is because we know um, that Ohio's demographics are changing. Ohio's racial and ethnic diversity has always been a source of cultural, social, and civic prosperity. But today, communities of color are also the key driver of our population growth. Between 2010 and 2020, all of the growth in Ohio occurred among Ohioans of color. And as you can see on my screen, showing growth up through 2050, as our population continues to become more diverse over time, the benefits of eliminating racial disparities will become even more significant. Next slide. So there is room and opportunity for all Ohioans to take meaningful steps to dismantle systemic racism and to improve the health and economic vitality of our state. It's also important to note that this isn't an all or nothing equation that we're talking about, but that we can realize some of these economic gains as we make progress towards eliminating uh, disparities in our state. So we here at HPIO love a good evidence-informed recommendation. We couldn't leave you without steps that we could take to um, help improve. So we prioritized six action steps for Ohio and provided a bunch of examples in the report of state and local governments who have implemented them. So a couple examples include um, implementing and assessing policies and programs that promote fairness and justice, such as the Miggs County's health equity policy, um, tailoring policies and practices to support Ohioans of color, with a good example being Toledo's Racial Equity and Inclusion Council, allocating funding and resourcing resources to support policies that strengthen Ohio's communities, uh, such as the uh, Franklin County and City of Columbus Housing Action Fund. Next slide. We also um, want to highlight increasing accountability for eliminating disparities in outcomes, such as through the Ohio Equity Initiative Evaluation Project. Um, also implementing criminal justice policies that provide accountability and address the underlying drivers of crime, including the deferred prosecution programs, um, such, like, such as uh, the one in Montgomery County. And finally, increasing equitable access to financing, support, and business resources for Ohioans of color, such as through Ohio's Minority Business Enterprise Program. So finally, last slide, please. I wanna drive home that we can increase the health and economic vitality of our state by eliminating these disparities that are being experienced by Black and Latino Ohioans. And that if we take action, we can grow our workforce, increase consumer spending, strengthen communities, and reduce uh, those fiscal pressures on state and local budgets. But if we fail to act, we stand to continue losing billions of dollars each year. Um, to make this meaningful change though, we need participation from leaders like all of you in both the public and private sector. So that's why we are so grateful that you were able to join us here today. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I, I really want to emphasize the point that um, this is not an all or nothing proposition, that even incremental steps taken by um, each of us individually or collectively through organizations or community groups can make a difference. 
and it can improve health and economic vitality in our state. Um, there was a question in the Q&A box about, you know, this seems so overwhelming, where to start, what can we do? Um, and I think Glennon um, had a very eloquent response to that. So you may want to take a second and just take a look, look at it. Um, she closed that response by saying, we need to be bold, audacious, and relentless, um, just like the folks who created the, this mess were. And remember that we're not doing this work alone, that there are many others also doing this work. Um, and, and just always remind ourselves that we don't know the impact today that our actions are having, um, that they will bear fruit later. Um, Director Dawson, who's next up, um, what, who recently told uh, or used a parable um, that uh, maybe, maybe you could repeat today, Director Dawson, related to the gazelle um, that I thought I, I ha that has been an analogy that has sat with me since you used it. Um, and if, you, if any of you have questions for Carrie or the rest of the HPIO team, um, please feel free to put those in the Q&A box or the chat. Thanks again, Carrie. Um, we have a poll question um, for you all. And, or actually a set of full questions. Um, so the first one is, as a result of attending the forum, I have increased knowledge of the connections between race, place, and disparity. So please select your answer to those question, that question. Um, we also have a couple of questions related to rating the quality of our speakers so far. And, um, increased awareness of how eliminating disparities in income, health outcomes, and incarceration can result in economic benefits across Ohio. And then another question related to the, the quality of our second speaker, Terry. So please just take a moment and respond to those four poll questions. It's very important to us to collect your feedback so that we can improve future webinars to better serve all of you and to better influence evidence-informed policymaking in our state. Uh, we've been on now for nearly an hour. We're so glad that so many of you are still with us because we have a fabulous panel coming up next. Um, we encourage you to Stretch, move around a bit. If you haven't already, you might see that I'm standing now just to stretch my legs a little bit um, and to stay alert so that we can digest the information that will be shared by our panel. Um, one thing that will help with our um, ability to pay attention to the panel and all of the insights share is the, the <laughs> liveliness of our moderator for our panel discussion, um, Director Angie Dawson. Um, she currently has served or serves as the Executive Director of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health. The commission is dedicated to eliminating disparities in minority health through innovative strategies and financial opportunities, public health promotion, legislative action, public policy, and systems change. I'm going to turn it over to Director Dawson to get the conversation started and to introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Amy. We appreciate certainly the opportunity to be here and uh, just so grateful for the opportunity to share on this extremely important topic. Uh, when we plant the soil of contemplation, we shall reap in the harvest of action. And so much of what we do when we look at data and we study the information and we look at the historical experiences of those that are most impacted, then our harvest shall be one of action. We certainly extend our gratitude to our panelists uh, for their time and contributions and importance of this topic. 
and today presents yet another learning opportunity presented by HBIO to acknowledge the examples of the work that is being done in Ohio to address the unjust barriers Ohioans of color and disadvantaged Ohioans continue to face where they live, work, learn, play, and age. And these unjust barriers are embedded in policies and institutions, which result in a cascade of consequences that limit opportunities for good health, good life, and full life expectancy. It also presents an opportunity to see the tremendous economic benefit of eliminating disparities. So today's panelists represent a variety of different sectors, and they will highlight the work that they are doing to eliminate racial disparities and inequities within their organizations, as well as within their local communities. Our efforts are to make Ohio a model of health, well-being, and economic vitality. So joining us on the panel today, we have Ms. Kazim Ahmed, who serves as the Senior Policy Coordinator for the Health Policy and Equity at the Alcohol and Drug Addiction and Mental Health Services Board of Montgomery County. Also joining us this morning is Ms. Selena Kunanan, who serves as the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Belonging Officer for University Hospitals, and I'm proud to say the Vice Chair of the Board for the Ohio Commission on Minority Health. And finally, Mr. Eric Kearney, who serves as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, and previously served as former state senator for Ohio's 9th district. So we are so happy to have these individuals who are doing the work of equity. What I'd like to do is to have each of them share a brief overview of your organization for the audience. Ms. Ahmed, followed by Ms. Kunanan, and then Mr. Kearney. Thank you. Um, good good afternoon, everyone, almost. It's almost 12 on the dot. So thank you for having me here today um, to HPIO. Excited to share what Adamus does. Um, so as I was introduced, my name is Tazine Ahmed, and I serve as a Senior Program Coordinator for Health Policy and Equity at the Montgomery County Adamus Board. And I want to take just a minute, just in case there's someone who's unfamiliar with what an Adamus Board is, to just state that. So every county in the state of Ohio is mandated to have a mental health board. I am with that board for Montgomery County, which again is known as the Montgomery County Alcohol, Drug Addiction and Mental Health Services Board, which many times you'll hear referred to as ADMIS or a Mental Health Recovery Board, MHRB. We are a fiduciary entity for mental health and addiction treatment and prevention and early intervention providers within Montgomery County. Essentially what that means is that agencies in the same county who provide services for individuals seeking assistance for mental health concerns, addiction services, and behavioral health professional training apply to our board for funding each year. We are funded through many different sources such as the Health and Human Services Levy of Montgomery County, as well as numerous other local, state, and federal grants. Our mission is to transform innovative behavioral health leadership and partnerships to promote a healthy region with a vision that is to have an inclusive world where optimal brain health equity ensures no one suffers in silence. So that's just a gist of an overview of what we do as an Adamus board here in Montgomery County. And Ms. Kunanit. Thank you so much, Director Dawson. It's a pleasure to be with you here. Um, and with my distinguished panelists, I want to thank Amy Rowley McGee and the HPIO staff for inviting me to be part of this panel. And excuse my voice as I'm I'm just recovering from a, a little bit of an upper respiratory infection. Um, so, but my name is Selena Kunanan. I am the University Hospital's Chief Diversity, Equity, and Belonging Officer. My background is, is that of a certified nurse midwife. So I've been a certified nurse midwife, still practicing, just saw patients this morning um, here in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, over the course of my 22-year career, year career at University Hospitals, I've caught over 1,000 babies here in Cleveland. Um, and so really very invested 
invested in the well-being of the community, the women and children and families that we service. Um, my kind of uh, desire or, or love of the diversity space really stems from that um, that beginning in the maternal child health space. For those that aren't familiar with University Hospitals, we were founded in 1866 um, in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and are built on the, the assumption that the most needy are the most worthy. Um, and so we consider ourselves the hometown team here in Cleveland. Um, we are very focused on taking care of our community and only our community here. Um, and it's been a real privilege to be part of this organization for the last 22 years. Um, we are the second largest employer in the region. Um, and healthcare is our number one industry with our friends and partners. The Cleveland Clinic is the largest employer in town and UH as the second largest employer in town with over 33,000 employees. UH has the largest geographic footprint of, our, of the primary care network here in Northeast Ohio. Um, and we are in many different spaces, including the city of Cleveland, which is over 50% black, but we also have um, uh, over 200 health centers and hospital systems that um, range uh, the rural areas as well. Um, we are in uh, caring for the Amish population in some of our rural areas, um, as well as Hispanic populations on the west side um, of Cleveland. So my real love and desire to be in this space is really um, uh, to built off of that uh, desire to care for women and children um, in my career. And so really from that, we in at UH, you know, we really saw a need to address the maternal and child health crisis that was going on with infant mortality in our region. Um, and so our organization has really kind of approached that in, in, in many unique ways over the course of the last 20 years in my practice. Um, you know, back in the day, we started a program called Centering Pregnancy, um, which is group prenatal care. We now know centering pregnancy to be kind of a cost, a cost effective and really effective way of reducing preterm birth, which is the largest driver for infant mortality. Um, and we've grown that program to be the second largest program in the country here in Cleveland. We've had over 3,000 women um, attend centering pregnancy um, and really where they're finding what the magic is, is that support that they're having in those groups. Um, we are so we were so certain that this was the model that we wanted to do that when we built our new Rainbow Center for Women and Children um, off of our campus, we built it in the Huff neighborhood or in the Midtown area, which at the time that we cut the ribbon in 2018 had one of the highest infant mortality rates in the nation, and we built our center around growing our centering pregnancy program. Um, you know, that program, that, that place-based investment strategy that we had was really focused on providing complete wraparound services for women and children. So not only do women get prenatal care there, they can get imaging, pharmacy, mental health, um, vision, dental, social needs navigation, legal aid, nutrition, uh, a dietitian, lactation. We try and make this really easy for moms and families. And we've really been quite successful at doing that. And we now know that that type of care is really the what we are going to do at university hospitals. We know that kind of complete wraparound services is where we should have all of our co-branded women's and children's services together. And really Thank from you. that, you know, we really want to make sure that we're addressing all of the social determinants of health, which is really why that kind of model was really, really important. Thank you so much. And Mr. Kearney, an overview of your organization. Well, Director Dawson, it's wonderful to see you. I think that's the first time you've ever called me Mr. Kearney, but I'll take it. I know. It. I, I've I'll got, take I've got Senator great hair any now. day. I'll take <laughs> Senator. <laughs> no, 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 Eric. Yeah. So I've got gray hair. So you're calling me Mr. Now. That's really nice. Um, first of all, let me say that HPIO is doing fabulous work. Um, Amy is is a great leader, and the the research that they're doing is so uh, important to the state of Ohio and to the country. And so I'm, I'm really honored to be a part of it, and it's great to to see uh, longtime friends like like you, Director Dawson. So it's it's really good to see you. Um, the Ohio uh, Chamber of Commerce is a uh, business advocacy organization. You know, there are different types of chambers of commerce in the state of Ohio across the country. Some advocate for certain policies, some do programming, some uh, do networking. Well, well the, the Ohio Chamber is like those organizations. So it does a lot of policy work uh, advocating for uh, policies that are good for uh, Ohio's businesses. Also, they put on a number of events, 
24 in a year uh, for, for 2023. Next year, it'll probably be about 28. So there's a lot of activities there. And then there are various committees on which members can participate. One of those committees is the Diversity, Equity, and, and Inclusion Committee on which um, I, I lead as the, the staff liaison. And so we cover issues. One of the issues that we covered at our last meeting was the connection between health disparities and uh, the business community. And Amy came in and gave an absolutely fabulous presentation to help with that. So that gives you a quick overview of the Ohio Chamber of Commerce and my connection to it. And so um, look forward to the discussion with um, super talented uh, panel members. Thank you so much. So we have about 20 minutes to bring this wonderful opportunity of learning home. So I'm going to ask you to briefly talk about what work is happening in your organization or in your community to eliminate disparities and advance equity? Ms. Cunanan. Thank you, uh, Director Dawson. You know, I can think of a couple things and just two examples I wanna kind of shout out. Um, you know, probably because it's fresh on my mind. I also serve on the board of First Year Cleveland, the steering committee. And First Year Cleveland is our infant mortality um, kind of task force in the region, looking at creating partnerships between community hospitals, government agencies to really kind of uh, convene around the crisis of maternal um, and child health and infant mortality in our region. And I know many of my friends, including the executive director, Angela uh, Newman White is on this call right now. Um, so I'd be remiss in not mentioning the strong work of First Year Cleveland and really pulling community members together and stakeholders around this. And through that collaborative, um, really looking to address and bringing down that infant mortality rate in our region. We have had success um, in that area. It's, there's still a lot of work to do, but we're doing it um, and really breaking down those barriers. So really proud of being a part of that since its inception. Um, and you know the fact that we really uh, named racism as a key driver for infant mortality um, when we first um, became uh, active in uh, many years ago. So I want to say that from a community perspective and a collaborative, I really want to give a shout out to First Year Cleveland and all of the work that's being done by so many. Um, from the, an organizational perspective at UH, one of the things that's really unique, and you and I have talked about this, that we're really excited about is, you know, and it's kind of very, goes very well with some of the things that were talked about today was, you know, we've engaged in a housing and health initiative. Um, we are partnered with the NRP group in um, Cleveland um, and wonderful working with David Heller and his team um, at the NRP group. And we've built affordable housing um, in the Glenville neighborhood, a traditionally disinvested area, um, which where there's not been a lot of revitalization, as much revitalization as needed, it's starting to. Um, but the thing that's unique about this is that, you know, people are like, well, why is UH in a housing complex? We actually have a community wellness center on the first floor. And in that we have our housed, our food for life market, which is our fifth market along with the teaching kitchen. And that's an innovative kind of partnership in collaboration with the Greater Cleveland Food Bank to address food insecurity for people. And also that in tying that, uh, that food is medicine initiative to say how access to healthy food will definitely impact your health outcomes. Um, so excited to have done that and be in that kind of um, space to help those 52 residents that are in there, as well as anyone else in the community that wants to come through our doors. We wanna be that kind of connection and gateway to health. Um, so there's not direct provision of services, but we have our fabulous community engagement team along with community health workers, our registered dietitian, our culinary medicine team, really looking to how do we how can we improve health of our communities by being in community where they are. Thank you so much. Excellent examples of organizations going beyond traditional barriers and boundaries and scope of work. Uh, Ms. Tazim Ahmed, can you share the work that's happening at the Adams Board of Montgomery County? Yeah, absolutely. Um, before I say that, I just want to say kudos to you, Selena. Like, that sounds amazing. Like, the more you talk, I'm just like, please tell me more. Um, you can come for a visit. Absolutely. Everyone should come. 
Absolutely. And that is the work that we try to do with all of our sectors. Um, it's so important that we're working across sectors. But just to give an example of work in our organizations happens across the entire continuum of care. And by that, I mean across the continuum of care, behavioral health care. So from providers and prevention, early intervention to treatment and supportive services, we're trying to build in measurable diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging outcomes for the services that our providers provide in the community, making sure that they are equipped to provide it and how we can support it through trainings that we can offer, um, how we as a board can come along and strategically plan for the diversity that makes up Montgomery County, how do we support them with evidence-based curriculum for that population? Another example would be through the grant work that we do to address root causes of social determinants of health and make sustainable changes. For example, the imp implementation of screening, but also at the same time, while we're working on policy level work, we understand that we have to always work at multiple points within the system. So we work at both those upstream factors and then those downstream changes such as support for community conversations that play an important role for us to be be absolutely sure that what we're doing for the community, the community has a voice within that strategic planning and that we can say we allocate our resources based on equity and the needs of the community from the voices of the individuals whom we work with to serve. Excellent. And it's so important as organizations are the providers of funding that they meet the need and place the funding where the data indicates. Senator Kearney, can you talk just briefly about two examples of what the Ohio Chamber is doing to advance equity? Um, yes, so uh, two uh, quick points. One, I would say the blueprint, which is a document that uh, the Ohio Chamber put together that outlines the major initiatives that, that uh, will drive change in the state of Ohio. And so one of the recommendations is improve health outcomes and address the drug crisis. There are four key points under that. One, increase residents' ability to access care. Two, make efforts to eliminate health disparities. Three, increase awareness and access to addiction treatment. And four, incentivize long-term uh, insurance care amongst younger Ohioans. So. Those are uh, the key points that came out of the blueprint. I would encourage people, if you have a moment, to go to ohiochamber.com and you can download the entire uh, blueprint for Ohio. And I, I think that's a, a good use of um, people's time. Then the second point uh, to answer, answer your question is we have various committees. So I mentioned earlier the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, but there's also a health policy, healthcare policy committee. And that's important because the way that the laws are made in Ohio uh, have an impact on policy. The, the first speaker this afternoon made, the, made a great connection between the law and, um, and the outcomes and the impact on people's health. So remember, there were clauses in people's deeds that were race-based and how that impact the health of African-Americans, um, the Latinx community and other communities as well. So um, those would be the, the two points I would, I would focus on um, in Thank answer you to so your question. Thank you so much, we really appreciate that. And it emphasizes the importance of strategic planning and allowing the prioritization of those policies should be seen in organizations, not just their strategic plans, but also in the work that they implement. You also gave me the opportunity, as you always have, Senator, to do a great segue to the next question. So Ms. Glenna Sweeney from the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, provided that historical overview, if you will, of redlining and the historical and current day impact. As we work together to undesign the red line, can you share one local, state, or federal policy that you would say would be most important in advancing equity? Well, for, for me, um, I, I, I grew up, my mom was a teacher, and so I'm just going to rely upon education. And, and I would say 
um, helping people to learn more about the impacts of health. Um, I've got a, a son who's a sophomore at Miami, and some of his friends think that vaping is safer than smoking cigarettes. Right? I mean, don't don't cause cause my head to explode. But you you understand about the the education piece and making sure that people understand that um, that both are unhealthy. Uh, choices. So I would say education is the is the number one thing that we can do in the state of Ohio to help our citizens the most. And I, I think that the work that HPIO is doing dovetails well, well with that. Excellent. Ms. Ahmed, can you share one local, state, or federal policy change for the purposes of advancing equity? What What would that be for you? So I'm going to say this thinking about like utopia in mind, because I understand there's so many factors that would go into this, but we in Montgomery County have done a lot of work around food equity and really meeting with our community and understanding, you know, Maslow's hierarchies of needs and what our community needs. And so from the pre presentations we saw earlier today from both Glennon and Carrie and what they shared about us being able to work alongside the business sector and then looking at redlining and where in our communities, if we can mandate like large grocery stores, um, because if you were to map them out, I can almost confidently say everywhere you'd see that T shape again of where they're populated and where they're not, who has access to those essential resources, whereas who has more barriers to getting those essential resources. And so I think if we could work on policies where we're able to provide the necessary needs people have in the areas that's best to them and be able to break down those barriers, then we would be able to interrupt things like intergenerational trauma. We would be able to expand those life expectancies in areas where within a five to 10 mile radius, there's such a high disparity. And so for me, really focusing on those food stores, just because we're working in the space of food equity right now, but I'm sure that goes for all of the different social determinants of health. Certainly. And Ms. Cunanan, knowing your focus is one of health, what would you say would that one state, local, or federal policy would be for you in terms of what we need to do to really propel this work around equity? I think maybe when I first started out or a couple of years ago, I would have said universal health care coverage, but it really goes much deeper to that. It really goes to these basic needs. And, you know, tagging on to what Tazine was saying, I agree, is the access to food, uh, healthy food provisions, right? Uh, because there's certainly access to food type, you know, not whole foods, right? But to unhealthy foods in uh, certain communities. Um, because they don't have a grocery store there. Um, but I, I agree. I think that the access to healthy food and, and I'm in this food space now helping to lead some of that food insecurity work for UH um, and in the region, I think is a really important one to look at um, because if people don't have access to healthy food, they can't achieve their optimal levels of health and well-being. It's just not possible. Um, you know, basic needs need to be met. Um, and so really access and, and um, maybe mandating of, of groceries, you know, mandating investment in disinvested neighborhoods would be the way to go. Um, instead of, you know, we've, we've taken all these years to get to where we are and we see the health disparities that exist. Now, how are we going to reverse that? How are we going to reverse engineer and now reinvest in those neighborhoods? It starts with housing. It starts with anchor institutions moving into areas as well. Not talking about gentrification, but, you know, for example, our Rainbow Center, when we opened it, there was really nothing in that Midtown area. Now we have several foundations that have moved in there. We got Dave's Grocery Store to build, you know, to open a grocery store across the street from our center. And that was the first grocery store in the Huff neighborhood in decades. Um, and so we need to understand that as institutions, the choices we make and where we choose to invest in and say, put our stake in the ground has a huge influence on other institutions as well. And so we all can kind of, you know, it feels overwhelming, but we all have parts to play in this. Um, and we need to look at our own policies and procedures and what we do as an organization and how we invest in communities. Certainly, there's an African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And you spoke to the whole notion of 
the work that we do, the, the seeds we plant, uh, the ground we till, uh, it's important for us to continue to move forward with the knowledge that if I'm tilling the hard ground of a mindset and that resistance, I'm going to go forward in that work. How do you go about creating allies and champions within and without your organization for that collective work to occur around equity? Ms. Kunanen. You know, I think that, um, how do we see each other's humanity? I think that if we could do that, it would solve lots of problems in the world. Um, that my children have every right to uh, live a fair and equitable and happy life just as anyone else's child. Um, you know, I know that my kids who are half black, you know, are entering the world and being looked at as, as a, um, at a disadvantage in, almost in a way um, because of how people will judge them based on how they look. Um, and it, it would be great if we could eliminate or reduce that bias or that stigma around things. How do we, and so that's always how I try and build bridges with people is to talk about the things that draw us together and that are in common that we have together um, as, opposed, as opposed to those things that pull us apart. Um, and so I think we can all agree that every baby deserves to live to see its first birthday. Every mother deserves the support. It does, it need, uh, they need to thrive and be successful as a parent. Um, and I always kind of try and come back to those things um, when um, I'm engaging in difficult conversations. Um, how do we bring, how do we pull people together? How instead of pulling people apart, let's see the the what we all want. We all the commonalities. We all want to love and be loved. We all want to prosper and be successful. We all want freedom. We all want our, a better life for our children, and that's what we really need to focus on. And that's how what I try and do in my work. Certainly, it certainly is all about relationship, or it isn't about anything. And thank you for talking about that bridge, Senator Kearney. Can you talk about you know, what you are doing, you are working with the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, the, the very entity that brings organizations together. Can you talk about what you do to build the collaboration with those agencies and going beyond those and bringing other agencies in to, to support this work around equity? Yeah, so um, thank you for that question. It's, um, this is a new position at the Ohio Chamber, and I think people who, who understand the history of the organization will understand that, um, you know, there's, some, there's a big field to plow, I'll put it that way. And um, so uh, what I've tried to do is to reach out to other economic development organizations, and they've been very welcoming. I have to make sure that I thank the, you know, the SBA because we've got a group of diverse chambers from ethnic chambers to those that are regionally based that come together and we talk about uh, disparities that are found in the economic community in terms of not only wages, but just economic opportunity, the ability to grow a business for entrepreneurs to realize their full potential in the state of Ohio. And so that's been really wonderful. Um, the other thing I, I would point to is we annually we have what's called the DEI Summit, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Summit. It's been very successful. We've had over 300 people attend each year, and we come together and we talk about uh, ways that diversity and equity inclusion can be incorporated into organizations in Ohio, how we can have more people belong, feel belong belonging inside organizations. And then the, the third point that I would make is um, next month, or not next month, but in December, we're having a supplier diversity conference where we're bringing in people to talk about supplier diversity. It's a term that's used a lot, right? But a lot of companies have not incorporated it, incorporated into their daily operations. And so we're going to encourage people to do that and to know that there are opportunities to provide minority and women-owned companies with opportunities so that the entire Ohio economy grows. Thank so you. those are those are succinctly, I hope I was succinct. 
Thank you. Well, Dr. Martin Luther King, famous quote, we are all caught up uh, in this web of mutuality, uh, in this fabric, if you will, and what affects one uh, indirectly, directly affects another. But this web of humanity, if you will, is what we are moving toward so that we can see the humanness uh, in each other. When we talk about uh, inspiring others to come forth and do this work, we know that more often than not, uh, we may be that clarion lone voice crying out in the wilderness, if you will. So when we talk about uh, the whole notion of pushing and motivating individuals to come into this, the road to justice is often narrow and unpaved. What advice would you give to individuals who are saying, I think I might speak up. I think I may try to do this equity work. What advice, Ms. Ms. Ahmed, would you give individuals who are knowing something is at ease or at dis-ease, if you will, and how do you motivate them to get involved in this equity work? So I think I'd go back to the quote that you mentioned earlier of, if you want to go, I'm going to, I'm going to mess it up. So I'm not going to try to say it again, but the one where you talked about, if you want to go far versus, you know, if you want to go fast. And I think that's really important because a lot of times we look at individuals and we tend to group, our brains tend to group people by certain factors, by certain demographics, but each individual is a multifaceted human being. A lot of times we say, meet the community where they're at, and what does that really mean? Are we meeting them where we're at because we're trying to break down a barrier and just solve a problem? Are we meeting them where we're where they're at because we want to learn from them and get to know them? And so just like you you have a personality inside of you that people don't know until they get to know you, that those communities that make up our whole community together are the same. And so I would say, if you want to work with people, you have to know those people. You have to get to know who they are on the inside and not just for you know the identities and the demographics that you can see on the outside. A lot of us are familiar with the cultural iceberg. And so what's on the top versus what's on the bottom. And I think in doing that, you form those relationships, you form that level of community that really does just that it takes you farther and it builds sustainability and it truly builds this interconnectedness to allow you to do the work that not just gets done but then is sustained and we have that which selena touched upon earlier about what do we all want a life that's better for us and our families where everyone's thriving together and that's i think the way to be able to do that Thank you. And so thank you certainly uh, to all of our panelists as Ms. Amy Roland McGee, outstanding uh, with, in her efforts to address this issue along with her staff. This is not going to be the first opportunity as we come together to address this issue of equity and unlocking Ohio's economic potential related to it. We certainly want to say thank you to our panelists for sharing the harvest of their equity work and appreciate their determination to continue in this effort. As we work to build toward equity, let me leave you with the words from the late Congressman John Lewis. For those of you who are coming into this work, those of you who have been in this work, and those of you who do not know anything but to do this work, do not get lost in a sea of despair, but be hopeful, be optimistic even. Our struggle is not a struggle of a day, a week, a month, or even a year, but rather this is the struggle of the lifetime. Never, ever, ever be afraid to make some noise and to get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Thank you to our panelists for all the good trouble you have been getting into. Thank you. Miss Amy. Thank you, Director Dawson, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I'm, I'm leaving feeling renewed and inspired. I hope that 
all of you are as well. Um, just fabulous, a fab fabulous distillation of many action steps that we can all consider taking as we move forward in this important work. We want to close with a few housekeeping details. First, we have a few more poll questions for you. We hope you will respond to these um, quickly before you need to leave. The first one is just um, related to our panel. How would you rate the quality of the panel as a whole? And I think that might be the only question for this set of polling questions. So we is. still have a little bit more for you, so don't leave yet. Please, please vote. And while we're talking about voting, remember to vote in the upcoming election too. Um, voting was mentioned as a way for you to influence policy making, and um, given the time of year, we want to emphasize that um, all of our votes matter, and encourage everyone to participate in our upcoming election. Oh, Jacob. Wow. Look at you. Very quick. He posted vote.ohio.gov, a site for more information about voting. All right. And then uh, here's some other food for thought for you in terms of ways to influence policy. Um, we know that our elected officials are there to serve us and want to hear from their constituents. So we hope that you'll consider getting more involved in the policymaking process. Um, even if it's only a smart, small part of what you do to advance equity in our state, um, consider uh, meeting with your elected officials, writing letters, making phone calls, getting to know them personally. Um, we talked about getting to know the people you serve personally, and yes, that is extremely important, but our elected officials are people just like us um, and getting to know them and building a relationship with them before we're asking for something in particular can be very effective in terms of um, influencing the policy making process. Um, next slide, please. All right, do we have we have a few more poll questions? Okay, here we go. Um, last. Um, we'd like to know how likely you are to use the information presented in today's forum to influence the policy making process. And then just overall, how would you rate the quality of today's forum? And um, our goal is to have a diverse range of, of backgrounds and perspectives represented by our forum speakers and presenters. So, how effective or how successful were we in reaching that goal for today's forum? Uh, we also aim to be objective and balanced in the information we provide. So please rate us on that. And um, in all the work we do, um, we want to make sure that we're both accurate and credible. So we'd love your feedback on that particular question as well. Again, thank you for, I'm so glad that so many of you have um, stayed with us through the end of the forum. We hope that means that you've uh, gained a lot of useful information today that you can take back and implement in your own organizations or personally. I think we can close out the poll question. Um, again, you can download the slides and other resources from our events page on our website. And here's other ways that you can connect with us. Um, we are active on LinkedIn, um, so please follow HPIO on LinkedIn and connect with our staff. Um, we also have um, a mailing list, and um, you can subscribe to our health policy news. And we, we would appreciate it if you could forward information about our organization to others who you think might benefit from being involved in our work, knowing about our mission, and um, perhaps be interested in serving or being added to our mailing list as well. Um, we just wanted to end with, again, this 
this pie chart, which you saw earlier today, um, and you know, challenge all of us to think about the the root causes um, of or the root root influencers um, of health, in particular those related to our social, economic, and physical environments, and how where we work, live, recreate um, influences both our access to high quality clinical care and our ability to make healthy choices and engage in healthy behaviors. Um, so just wanted to leave you with that. And this, this pie chart is also available on our website. So if you want to use it in your own presentations as a form of education to, for others, um, you can feel free to access it as well as um, much of our other slide presentations are available online too. And you can use that work um, in your efforts as well. Next slide. All right, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today, um, for engaging in our work um, and for everything you're doing to improve the health of Ohioans um, and achieve equity here in our state. We hope you all have a great day.